Welcome to MTN Outdoors. Hey there, welcome to this edition of MTN Outdoors. I'm John Riley, once again filling in for Andy Curtis. Andy apparently has been spending his time off alone in a small isolated cabin writing his book. Speaking of Lincoln, Montana, on this episode, we hear from the competitors in Montana's annual Race to the Sky sled dog race, which saw teams from around the country competing. Also on this episode, we hear what Montanans think about the potential of grizzly delisting, see how Montana ranchers are handling calving this season, and get a first-hand look at how first responders are training for and responding to winter rescues. Since this is Montana, though, of course we're starting off with the dogs. MTN's Ryan Bird caught up with the winners of this year's Race to the Sky. Jesse Royer is this year's Race to the Sky 300 mile champion. Royer has been mushing for 31 years and this is her seventh Race to the Sky first place finish. Royer of Sealy Lake finished under High Country Snack Foods Archway in Lincoln on Monday evening at 7.40 p.m. Placing first once again in Race to the Sky. While it's no surprise to see Royer glide through the finish line first, it was the conditions this year that was a key factor that helped her and her young team take first. The last few years have been really hard, uh, which is kind of like running on concrete. So it was kind of nice to have a little softer trail, which is easier on the dogs, especially all their, their joints, not quite so much pounding. So I thought the trail was actually in really great shape. All four of the mushers and their dogs finished the 300 mile race, which took them from Lincoln to Sealy Lake to Owl Creek and back. One of the newer mushers in this year's Race to the Sky, Eric Olin, finished second in the 300 mile, right behind his mentor, Royer. Olin is learning about mushing and racing Alaskan Huskies under Royer's wing. I don't think there's anyone in the lower 48 that I could learn as much from as Jessie. Um, she's, she's definitely, I mean, she's been doing it 31 years and she's got a lot of top 10 Iditarod finishes, so I don't think in my opinion, I don't think there's a better teacher in the entire world. Even though Royer qualified for the Iditarod last year, she ended up not participating in the race. This year, however, she qualified for the Iditarod and plans to compete with her Huskies. Royer's finished third in the Iditarod on multiple occasions and has competed in the race around 20 times. While this is a younger team going to Alaska than she's used to, she says the future is bright. I've got one veteran leader and I'm going to have like 13 rookies. So. Uh, I just want to get as many miles on them, as much, you know, race simulated experiences to the young dogs as possible. So when we head up to Alaska next week, actually, it's coming up fast. Um, we're just going to go have a fun race and maybe, maybe race a little bit more conservatively than we have in the past, just because they are young dogs still building them up with the looking, looking forward a year. Alaska's world famous Iditarod trail sled dog race is scheduled to start on March 4th. In Lincoln, Ryan Berg, MTN News. Seeing a grizzly is the pinnacle of wildlife sightings for many in Montana. And recently, those sightings have increased, which points to the success of bear management programs, but also poses a new problem for the state. Last week, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said it's starting a 12-month period in which it'll determine if grizzly bears in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem should be removed from the endangered species list, a decision that has many in the treasure state divided. Well, bears are, of course, our apex predators, but they're also keystone species, which means hundreds, if not thousands, of other animals rely on them. Jeff Ewelt is the executive director at Zoo Montana and said while the rebounding grizzly population that now sits at around 1,100 is encouraging, there's still work to be done. That number's a great number, don't get me wrong, but we need it to be higher so we can account for the expected loss in terms of habitat loss, in terms of hunting losses that we're going to see. Let's pad it, get that number to a comfortable point so this 1100 is kind of the baseline where we can start. But there are plenty of Montanans that support delisting. Mac Menard is one of them. Menard is the executive director of the Montana Outfitters and Guide Association. He mentioned that the successful management programs are why grizzlies should be delisted down the road and that the state's control over the grizzly populations simply makes the most sense. Once the bears have reached a threshold, like wolves, where our management system can be employed, we're going to be in better footing than we will be if we leave it to the federal government. And while Menard is a vocal proponent of hunting, he says that's not the driving force for his or his organization's support of delisting. Our motivation isn't about quickly establishing a hunting season. There's, there's no pressure for that. There's pressure for that only if, if it's biologically sustainable. 
Only time will tell if delisting will happen. For now, folks like Ewell view bears like this one in Zoo, Montana, as a great symbol of the American West, and one that continues to need to be protected as humans infringe on their ranges. And now, they've got this small little kind of segregated area where they can survive, and we're once again looking to threaten that. Um, is that right? No, I don't think it is. In Billings, Phil Van Pelt, MTN News. Coming up after the break, we'll see how first responders have been training for and rescuing people this winter. But first, here's some trivia. Race to the Sky commemorates the Camp Remini War Dog Reception and Training Center that was located just outside Helena. But that race has gone by different names over the years. Do you know what the original name of the race was when they first started in 1986? Find out the answer after the break. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back. So do you know the original name of Race to the Sky? In 1985, a small group of sled dog enthusiasts got together and formulated a plan to bring distance sled dog racing to Montana. The first race was known as the Montana's Governor's Cup 500 Sled Dog Race, which took place in February 1986 and was the first 500 continuous mile sled dog race in the Treasure State. I'm always impressed with everything our first responders train for in Montana. Being a volunteer firefighter isn't easy, with people often saying it's something in the genes that makes them dedicated as they are to their community. For the Nagel family, there might be something to that saying. Alina Hodder reports. Not many teenagers would spend their weekend morning training on ice rescues, but that's exactly what 18-year-old Abby Nagel did this Saturday here at Lions Family Park. The Laurel High senior is following her father's footsteps, training to become a firefighter with Laurel's volunteer fire department. The bad thing is you gotta put rocks in the bottom of the street. It's not every day that you can suit up and jump into the freezing waters of Laurel's South Pond. But for 18-year-old Abby Nagel, this is part of her rookie training as a firefighter. We'll be back for you in a second. This last week, I learned how to drive a stick shift for the first time, so that was a lot of fun. Abby comes from a family of firefighters. Her dad, Travis, has been a firefighter with the Laurel Fire Department since 2009. His own dad was a volunteer firefighter in Lewistown. I have two brothers that have both been on... Uh, volunteer departments within their communities as well so it's kind of a it uh, must be a, something in the blood. This meant Abby spent a lot of time at the Laurel Fire Department as a kid. Don't pop the victim. So they grew up down here at the station too. I think that helped pique the interest for them. And after she completes her training, the Laurel High Senior can add the title of firefighter to her long list of accomplishments. She was also on the varsity soccer and varsity cheerleading team in school. I'm also a part-time student for uh, at MSUB doing the University Connections program. And with graduation just around the corner, the National Honor Society member has her hands full with firefighter training. A lot of late nights sometimes with late night calls, but it's kind of power through the next day with a lot of a lot of caffeine. <laughs> she says fighting fires is the easiest part of the job. I think the most scary part is with the people. You know, like you're dealing with their, their property, like their house is on fire, you're trying to save their lives. And when she graduates this May, she'll juggle her time between classes at MSUB and firefighting. I'm gonna be going for elementary education because I wanna be a kindergarten teacher. And her dad couldn't be more proud. It's awesome to see youth that are giving back to the community and and showing that interest because there's not a lot to do. And then, you know, super bonus when it's your own kid that's doing it. In Laurel, Alina Howder, MTN News. In the past two weeks, Gallatin County Search and Rescue has received six calls, two south of Big Sky and four outside of West Yellowstone. I spoke with one of the volunteers involved in some of these rescues about why he continues to answer the call. Most of the calls we've had in the last month are, are all snowmobile rescues, either broken bones or um, lost and needed help uh, finding their way out. Big Sky Section Manager Mark Bradford says he joined Search and Rescue because he wanted to do what he thought someone else could do for him. I joined Search and Rescue, you know, a long time ago, and one of the reasons that I wanted to do it was I always felt like if I was injured in the Basque Country that, you know, I'd want me to come rescue me. He says search and rescue is no walk in the park. I always tell people that, that, that want to join search and rescue that, you know, it's never when you're sitting around on a Sunday afternoon waiting for a call to come. It's usually when you have a kid's basketball game to go to or it's Christmas Eve and you're trying to go to church that it's you have to kind of jump in and uh, 
you know, go to action. Last year, Search and Rescue's annual report says there were 140 missions, 36 searches, and 89 rescues. Captain of Search and Rescue Scott Secor says although call volume is high, it's about the same as last year so far. This year is actually right in line with last year, but to be fair, last year was a record year for us. He believes the influx of population around Gallatin County is why these rescue numbers continue to grow. I think with the amount of people moving to Gallatin County, you have to assume that the influx of population mixed with the access to the outdoors that we have here, those two things combined together just creates kind of the perfect storm for a high call volume search and rescue. He says it's important to keep a communication device handy as well as travel with a partner in the backcountry and recognize all the hard work the volunteers do to keep you safe. It's nice when people uh, recognize the good work that our volunteers are doing and, and really uh, realize that they're going out at all times of the day at all hours to rescue complete strangers. In Bozeman, Kristen Merkel, NTN News. You see this little black dot? It's right here. This is a person, and it's what many in Wyoming are calling a miracle in the Bighorn Mountains. It is a missing man. He was spotted by helicopter fighting for his life climbing out of waist deep snow after his snowmobile got stuck. He was pretty out of it. He never waved at the helicopter. They talked to him afterwards. He never heard or knew there was a helicopter and we were right over him a couple times. Mark Watkins is a contract pilot, but on this Monday mission, he was the spotter running radio, GPS and satellite phone calls to search and rescue. As crews in the air and on the ground frantically tried to find a missing snowmobiler before the sun went down. It was exhausting. The snow conditions were were very trying and definitely put us our skills to to the test. We were having anywhere from waist deep to shoulder deep, basically bottomless snow, basically like quicksand. We brought in some professional guides to assist us because of the technicality and they were even having issues. The 57-year-old Sheridan County snowmobiler vanished Sunday. Crews later learned he'd gotten stuck and spent the night in the cold starting a fire to survive. He last made phone contact just after 4 a.m. Monday morning. The train uh, was steep. It was heading into uh, the Box Canyon of the Tongue River area. And after a day of searching with darkness setting in yet again, concerns were rising. But miraculously, just before sunset Monday, Watkins spotted the missing man from high above, a tiny dot in the forest. Within our first ridge line, we went into a valley and sure enough, on the right side, I could see him trying to hike out. He may have been 50 or 100 yards from the top where there was you know, not just trails, but a turnaround for the sleds up there, but it was so steep they couldn't see. The sheriff's office says the man was hypothermic and suffering from frostbite on his hands and feet, but he survived. And while the man hasn't been publicly identified, he's now back home with his family. I did hear that there was no permanent damage. He went to a specialized burn unit down in Denver. I did get a call from the, his wife and she was very appreciative. A life saved thanks to a group of 30 some volunteers who didn't give up. In Wyoming, Diane Parker, MTN News. They are one of the oldest volunteer patrols in the country. These men and women that you see wearing red are the ones who are responsible for maintaining the safety at Showdown. And this group was recently awarded as one of the outstanding large alpine patrols, a worldwide award that is. But what exactly are their day-to-day -day duties? Our training is essentially patterned towards working in the outdoor environment and working in and particularly the winter and then an on hill training course that uh, occurs at showdown which is toboggan handling and ex and uh, special situations that you come upon in a in a ski area Alan Rabbit joined the patrol in 1979. He describes his experience being a part of ski patrol for the past several decades. The things I enjoy about ski patrolling is probably the, the, the first thing is the camaraderie and the people that you get to work with and the people that you get to, to meet. Um, in my mind, uh, the group that makes up the Great Falls Ski Patrol, there's probably not uh, a, a better bunch of people that I could possibly want to uh, be around. The Great Falls Ski Patrol is composed of 49 members, many of whom who have been on the patrol for up to three to four decades. 
And while it's a volunteer role, the amount of time and commitment dedicated to keep the public safe is what makes it a job. Uh, we do um, annual medical refresher training every year before the season starts. We do quite a bit of uh, skiing and toboggan work uh, when the season's just kicking in. Uh, we do ongoing training fairly regularly and have uh, meetings every month um, during the season as well. So, you know, the, um, the ski patrol has certainly a, a very high standard of care for taking care of the public. And uh, there is a commitment to, uh, if you want to be a patroller, to putting the time and effort in to making sure your skills are up. Look alive. Everybody wake up. Towards the end of a busy weekend, you can find a large table of patrollers unwinding. However, their work isn't complete until everyone has safely left the mountains. So you're, you're pretty involved throughout that whole day doing, um, you know, everything from hill maintenance uh, to the final sweep of the day, making sure that everybody's off the mountain, and then just being on call in case there are accidents on the mountain. Got to be ready for all that. The National Ski Patrol is made up of over 600 patrol units and over 32,000 patrollers worldwide. And although they are right at the bottom of the threshold for the large Alpine patrol category, this doesn't stop them from being awarded the top in the industry for 2022. While there are many positives to the job, there are also various traits required to work on the mountains. Uh, there's a pretty good time commitment for between the refreshing and the days that you do your uh, duty on the hill. Uh, so there's a pretty good time commitment there, but it's not a real arduous task to do any of it because again, you're, you're kind of doing it with fellow people that you want to be around and, and that are your friends. And while we hope we never need the assistance of ski patrol, we rest easy knowing that they are the most professional, prepared and trustworthy group of people. In Showdown, Cade Mentor, MTN News. Coming up after the break, we check in with a ranch to see how calving season is going this year and learn more about how farmers are working to make their voices heard at the legislature. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back. Montana sees more than a million calves born each year, and right now is the heart of calving season for many ranches. MTN's Ryan Gamboa checked in with a Dupuyer ranch to see how they're doing this year and learned how it's a 24 hours a day, seven day a week job. Inside the pickup on the Hitchcock Ranch, we're on the verge of life. In between chores, it remains a waiting game. Our due date actually isn't until the 6th of February, but we've already got 40 some calves on the ground. And, you know. Calving season has just begun, and for Mark Hitchcock, it's 24 7. I mean, we just keep doing our daily activities on top of it. It's just 24 hours a day. Somebody has to check them at least every two hours. Heading to the barn, we reunited a heifer with her newborn calf. These cows here were just, they just born last night, so. For new mothers, recognizing which baby is theirs poses a challenge. <coughs> Witnessing a homecoming that tugs on the heartstrings. The most beautiful sight that I have ever, that I see every spring is a calf standing nursing a cow. That means everything's, everything's right. Mark Hitchcock has been on this land for 42 years, seeing everything under the sun, building his operation from the ground up. I started out with absolutely nothing and was able to do what was, do the impossible, I guess, and, and build something. Having nothing is irrelevant when you have it all. Our heifers are outstanding. I mean, I, uh, I'm very proud of, the, of, of that. When they go on to feed, we've had, we fed them before in the feedlot. They, they've uh, done exceptional in the feed yard, so we know we're, we're doing the right thing. And amidst a tough few years for cattle ranchers, Mark and his family have kept the faith to abide by an ever-changing line of work. This is a good life and I'm very proud to be able to be part of it because the one thing about this world is, is that no matter what, you got to eat. And if I can provide food for somebody or a lot of people, I'm happy. A life of feeding others is food for the soul. So it's been opportunity and, and uh, people who believe in you and hard work to make this life. And I am not sorry for any part of it. In Depuyer, Ryan Gamboa, 
MTN News. About 45 members of the Montana Farm Bureau Federation were in Helena Monday and Tuesday, calling on the Capitol to give a voice to Montana's agriculture producers during this year's legislative session. We're original stewards of the land and we like to um, let them know what, how those bills affect us and what we can do moving forward. On Monday, Farm Bureau members and lawmakers met for a reception in the Capitol Rotunda. On Tuesday, they visited with state agency officials and Lieutenant Governor Kristen Juris and sat in on legislative sessions. They keep us informed on what's going on in the ag community from their perspective. Um, we get a chance to talk to them about what's going on from our perspective. Scott Stoner, who raises hay and quarter horses in Montana City, is a member of the Farm Bureau's Board of Directors. This is his third time attending the Calling on the Capitol event. It definitely makes an impact on uh, the legislators, and like I said, they love to hear from us. It's been a challenging few years for many Montana farmers and ranchers who've dealt with droughts and then rising costs. But Nicole Rolfe, the Farm Bureau's Senior Director of Governmental Affairs, says the outlook is improving. She says this session, the Farm Bureau is focusing on issues like water rights, property rights, and tax reductions, like the proposal to exempt more businesses from the business equipment tax. Really anything that um, has um, the ability to promote our rural communities, our farming and ranching family businesses, are all of discussion. Stoner says he was glad to learn more about the state's red tape relief initiative and to get to know the people making decisions that affect his operations. It is a great experience and I would certainly recommend it to any other uh, Farm Bureau members to um, take part in it. That's the best way to learn and, and um, don't hesitate to come down. This is the first time in four years that the Farm Bureau was able to hold their full Calling on the Capitol event in person here at the legislative session. In 2021, the event was held mostly virtually because of COVID. Leaders say it's valuable to be able to once again make face-to-face -face connections here. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. Well, that's going to just about wrap things up for this week's edition of MTN Outdoors. But before we go, since it was Valentine's Day recently, we've got a very special brag board featuring Montana Television Network couples. Here's my wife Jean and I up at Park Lake. Love you, beautiful. Here's James, Melissa, and Hannah Rafferty out snowshoeing. Dante Williams and Asia Hooker pictured skiing at Showdown. Diane Parker, her kids, and Blade Stiller enjoying some sledding. Kyle Hansen and Justice Redding pictured here in Zion. And finally, Andy and Angela Curtis, who have recently been joined by the newest member of their family. Congratulations to them both. Thanks again for joining us for this edition of MTN Outdoors. Have a good one. I'll catch you later. MTN, Montana's news leader.